The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's Brian and Mr. Betcher for Breaking Down Security this week. Hey, I'm back. You are back. Um, you know, the, the last couple of weeks that you've been gone, I had assumed that you were dealing with all the Log4j stuff. Uh, I guess that is not the case. Were you hit by that by any chance? You can yeah, say yes or no I mean, or blink once, whatever, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll blink twice. So I'm in trouble. Oh, okay, good. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, our, our company was hit by that. We had to... Mm upgrade some stuff uh we got it all done though in about a day day and a half so oh that's cool it wasn't too that's bad cool. all right very nice uh, if you don't hear miss berlin's voice and I, I will tell you um she has one of the worst excuses i've ever seen here uh when i when i asked her if she was going to be here she said no i'm going to be sleeping on a world war ii submarine tonight and i was like you could have picked a better you know, hmm. better, better excuse for that. So, uh, um, you know, you don't hear that one to, every day though. Uh, you know, I could have said, Hey, I'm going to be flying on the Elon Musk train to space or something, you know, that, that would have made, you know, that would have been just as plausible for me, but, um, no, Miss Berlin's not gonna, not gonna be here this week, but you know, to make up for it, we've, we've got two awesome people. Uh, we have April Wright and we have Alyssa Miller. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you both for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. it's a pleasure. Yep. Um, yeah, um, I'm sorry, Alyssa. You uh, you always seem to be here when Miss Berlin is not. Uh, I, I maybe it's maybe it's like this Superman thing. You know, both of you can't be in the same room at once, or you know, you're like anti particles or something. You cancel each other out. You know. I uh, I don't know, but I'm gonna have to. Uh, she's gonna hear from me about this one now. Does the the pretty sure this is number three now that I've been on the show, and she's failed on me every time uh, and the sub thing yeah. the sub thing come on now really yeah <laughs> yeah yeah she uh you know she's out with she's out with a a friend of hers um and uh i don't know what world war ii sub this is i'm going to have to ask her when she gets back uh yeah, but you know I, I tried looking at all places in the the cleveland uh, metropolitan area there are world war ii subs over there but i didn't, none of them looked very comfortable to sleep on so i don't know if she's doing it legally or not maybe you know it could be really uncomfortable bed but yeah yeah she, did you know, you know, did you know that? that ohio ohio has a navy Oh, oh, well, I'm sorry. They do. Ohio, yeah, Ohio has a Navy. Okay. I. And this is 100% what I'm not making this up. Ohio's Navy. It sounds like the time that Thomas Jefferson invited the Swiss Navy to an inaugural ball or something. Um, <clears throat> Ohio Naval Militia. Ohio's Navy since 1896. Holy crap. Okay. Well, that's going to go in the show notes, as is our want. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm imagining pirates. I, all I'm thinking is Johnny Depp with, you know, like wooden boats and stuff, but I could be wrong. But they're like Canadian I, pirates. <laughs> they're, as, they're really nice when they take your stuff. As a fellow Midwesterner, I, I have so many things I want to say right now, but I don't want to hurt the feelings of the Ohio folks. So I'll just be nice. Yeah, they've they've already they've already suffered enough. The Browns lost, and well, the Bengals are going to make it. But yeah, it's uh, for uh, that's football for all of you non-U.S. Americans uh, that are that are listening. We're in, we're in what they call the playoffs right now. But um, I think we I think we'll probably go ahead and get to the uh, the crux of our of our discussion here. Um, so last couple of weeks have of course everybody knows has been log 4j and there's a lot of discussion on twitter about uh open source sustainability and you know developers who are you know destroying their own code and, and pretty much burning everything down around them and uh we we have a couple of things we want to talk about there potentially but we also um there's there's also ongoing discussions and investigations about things like IOT and stalking and privacy. And those are some of the other uh, things we want to discuss as well. So, um, <clears throat> so I want to start with, I want to start with April and I want to ask about the, the open source issues. Uh, you're very plugged in with, with folks in the industry. Um, I don't know if you were affected by log4j 
Uh, I do know that answer because we talked about it before the show, but I just wanted to ask you that question because I'm a reporter type. Um, what is your what are what are your uh, thoughts about some of the the overarching topics uh, uh, with with open source about the sustainability, you know, developers wanting to get paid and big companies, you know, seemingly taking advantage of that. Um, you know, one one of the things I wanted to you know ask because we have other points of data here is is you know how how are your feelings about the open source uh, industry and the sustainability of that? <clears throat> well, I think that. Obviously, as we've seen, um, and as we, by design, open source is free. So the, people mm-hmm. are not making any money off of this unless they start like the, they, they go from Apache to like having, you know, real Apache that's, or, or even Red Hat back before Red Hat was at, like a company, it was just an operating system. So, you know, you can build things around open source, um, but not everybody wants to do that. Um, I, I honestly think that the biggest problems that we have right now in terms of any code anywhere is um, is more integrity than anything else. I think that in the past, we've been looking at availability for code and, or not, not availability, sorry, uh, confidentiality for code. Availability too is very important, but probably third on the list. But, you know, we've always tried to keep code secure by obscurity. You know, we, we try to make sure nobody gets access to the code, but what if somebody does? It's gonna happen. I mean, uh, repos are leaked all the time. People get access to things. So you can't just rely on that. I, I think it's better to try to prevent us from being, or, you know, anybody from being the next solar winds by, mm-hmm. and, and part of the, the challenge with open source is that doing code reviews and, and uh, affording tooling for SAS scanning, for example. Um, you know, right. these things cost money. And if you're not making any, then it doesn't make any sense. Right, right. Alyssa, yeah. uh, and, what, oh, sorry, Mr. Betcher, um, go ahead. You know, as many people used this uh, open source that we talked about, the Log4j, I mean, tools like Veracode didn't find it. So, right. you know. Right. Alyssa, um, you know, just uh, what, 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 were you, what were your thoughts when all this Log4j stuff went down? <laughs> Um, for starters, uh, holy crap. Um, but no, seriously, um, honestly, I was in a kind of a, I guess, compared to my peers, kind of a privileged position. And I say that because we did have software composition analysis in place in our pipelines. And so this thing, you know, it, it kind of started to show up on Thursday, on Friday that week is when like everybody finally started like realizing, oh my God, this is really bad. And so, I mean, I've been telling people, like, you know, by that Friday afternoon, we already had a list, uh, you know, across a large enterprise organization. You know, my division, I think we've got, I, I, it's hard for me to classify into apps anymore because we do a lot of functions and, you know, that, uh, the whole serverless thing. So, but, I mean, I had a list of, you know, all of our assets where we had log4j. And so from that perspective, it was, I, you know, a lot of organizations weren't in that boat, right? A lot of people, right. their first response was get all of our developers together, find out where we have Java, and then let's find out which of those Java apps have, you know, log4j, et cetera. So, you know, I, I do feel fortunate that we had that type of, uh, that we did have that visibility. Um, but it, it, it's been kind of frustrating because I've seen a lot of the, you know, the renewed scrutiny on the open source community. And, you know, I think some of it's fair and some of it's not, right? I, I mean, you know, first of all, you mentioned this concept and I've seen other people say it about, you know, organizations are taking advantage of the open source community. Like there's this, there's this evil corp that's, you know, oh, we can get free software, so let's use that. You talk to most organizations and they're not so thrilled about the idea of having open source in their software, but let's look at the open Mm -hmm. source community for a minute. All of these development ecosystems have their package managers, they have their repos out there. It's very easy for me to go in and whether I'm in Java with Maven or I'm using, you know, I'm in Node.js and, you know, whatever you're doing you're using a package manager and you're able to easily pull that code. 
So, you know, it, it's not like there's this huge, like, you know, they're being awful and they're, they're, they're using this code for free and then demanding the world of these developers. I, more of it is just ignorance that, you know, a lot of these organizations just don't realize the level to which they're using open source libraries and they, because they just don't simply realize the ease with which their devs are doing this and with the pressure that their devs are under to create code and create it quick and this is how you do it you don't reinvent the wheel you go grab i mean i i was a developer 25 years ago is when i got into this world right and even back then it was all about reusability so i think you know that's been kind of frustrating and then we talk about the the quality of the code and we talk about oh well these developers aren't paid and you know, they're volunteers and so they're not doing as much. And some of that's legit, right? Like, I mean, you know, if they had SaaS tools and they were running that, would they be better off? Maybe. Um, but you know what? I mean, this was a freak out because it was a widely used package. Absolutely. But this could have just as easily been Microsoft. This could have mm -hmm. just as easily been a bug in Windows. And it could have been just as difficult to patch or update Windows as it was to go out and find it in your own code and patch it in your own code. So we kind of blast the, the open source community like it's, it's the Wild West and everything's awful in open source. The reality is that it's awful everywhere if you want to look at it that way. I don't think it's awful. I think these things happen. They come up. They're hard to find because you've got multiple developers working on this thing. It would be the same thing if Microsoft was doing it. They would, or Apple, or you know, Netflix or whomever else. I mean, we can, we can run through the name. I don't want to just pick on one. But they all have large numbers of developers. Any one of them could introduce something like this. And, you know, it's... So I, I, I you know, I, I appreciate the scrutiny, but I think some of the judgmental attitudes out there are really unwarranted. I think right. it's unfair, too, because Microsoft and Apple and Meta and these other companies have the funds to throw into fixing this, you know, sp staying up all night for four nights trying to fix something and getting it out there. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that the, the biggest difficulty was not so much that it was it was such a bad vulnerability, but it was uh, decentralized in such a way. So let's say that there was a, a library in an operating system. You could pretty easily patch that because it's just one library for all the apps to use. Whereas this was not quite like that. Right. Right. I, I was listening to, you know, I was catching up on my podcast when I was out for my walk and risky business hat was, was talking about that. And they said, one of the, one of the things was log 4 J is not a first, like a first level dependency. You're going to have to go to like four or five dependency levels down to find this. So organizations, you know, Alyssa sounds like she's, you know, got a fairly, uh, you know, mature organization with understanding dependencies. There's organizations that don't even know that they're using Java and Chef or, you know, something like that. They don't know how far or how deep that rabbit hole goes. And, you know, having, you know, when I realized that, oh, this isn't a first tier, you know, uh, dependency kind of thing, you know, how far down are you going to go before you realize you've got log 4j or, you know, how, which systems have it and which ones don't. And, you know, is it easily patchable or do you have to maybe wait for a third party vendor? And I think that was the big thing. You know, some of, some of the people were saying it was going to take years to fix because you may not be able to patch that one library very easily, or, you know, you may patch it, but break something else, which would be even worse. You're kind of, you got your hands kind of tied because you can't do anything. <clears throat> Uh, so before we before we move on to the IoT stuff, Mr. Betcher, I wanted to ask you a question. You're you're a filthy software developer, um, and but you did not go the way of open source. You you made a product, you licensed it. What what what? Why did you decide not to release? I mean, you have a freemium model, but I mean, which is probably better for for open source. But why did you decide to not release it as an open source tool and decide to to charge for it? Other than well, being a so that we could charge for it would be the main reason, but um, yeah. we believe that um, you know most of the time when when uh, s small companies release uh, their software or even just you know developers who are really good at what they do and they they create uh, really awesome tools, uh, um, the community at large just downloads it and uses it, and not so much spends the time to make it better. 
You know, it's usually right. the developer or maybe one other person that, you know, gets involved in making the tool better. But the community at large really just takes the code and uses it in their own stuff or. Hmm. Um, so we didn't want that. <clears throat> we, we weren't, I mean, the, the odds that someone would help us a lot or that a lot of people would look at the code and make it better, we thought were slim and, and not worth mm. releasing. Right. Okay. That makes sense. It, you know, that's, that's your code and, you know, it, it works out for you. Um, you have a freemium model. Obviously you have a free version and then a paid version. Um, I was, I was wondering about, cause a few years ago in Texas, there was a, a thing about the breweries where they couldn't actually charge for alcohol. I think that's the, the thing. And the way the breweries got around it was they released, you know, they gave the beer away, but to actually drink the beer, you had to buy the glass. You know, and what I was wondering about was if, if open source could do something similar where we give the code away for free, but if you want the license, you know, which is the, you know, we give it to you as is or whatever that little, you know, five lines of code, which apparently there's enough apps out there that have, you know, five to 17 lines of code, you could probably do that, but to get the license to be able to use the code with that source, you know, you'd have to pay for that five lines of code. And I was, I was just wondering if that was, you know, um, yeah, I was just thinking out loud, but I was just thinking about, you know, that'd be the cup in, in this case instead of the beer. So, um, uh, yeah. I can, uh, along those lines, uh, there is, there are, uh, I guess licensing that says, okay, if you use this code, you have to release your entire software. Right. 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 Publicly. So there right. is a little bit of that. And I, I think you'd, you'd, if you looked at, if you were able to just audit everyone's code out there that does not release theirs publicly, mm. I'm sure you would find a lot of, um, of code out there that should be released that isn't because mm. they have used code with those particular types of licensing and yet they don't release their code. And, and it could be no one even bothered to look or check. Right. Right, that makes sense. <clears throat> Go ahead, April. Oh, I was just thinking about um, how Russia had that requirement where software companies had to uh, submit their code to the government basically to be reviewed before they were allowed oh. to sell it. Um, hmm. I, and I mean, I imagine, of course, most of that is probably not open source. So right. um, imagine the wealth of vulnerabilities they may have found just by having access to the source code. Right, right. I, I want to think, uh, I, again, going back to risky business, I think I heard a news story similar to where China was doing the exact same thing. It was like, if you send your code to the Google Play Store or something, they want to see your code before it gets uploaded. And I don't, um, I don't I'm not sure if, if it's how Russia was doing it or if there's, you know, obviously there being privacy issues, potentially, you know, are you even checking to see if something's being added after the fact or if there's any changes, but um, yeah, cool. Um, anything else before we get off the open source? Uh, I, oh, Alyssa, hello. Hey. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I just look at the whole thing and I, I think there's a misnomer here, you know, that, well, if devs in open source were paid, we wouldn't have security problems in open source. And again, I, I struggle with that because we have massive organizations that pay millions of engineers and QA staff and everything else, and they still make mistakes, right? right. Like, so, I mean, it's, that's where now, by the same token, do these people deserve to get paid for the stuff that they produce? Probably, um, you know, I mean, there's no two ways about it, but now you have to question, well, why, why would they then create this thing and give it away for free? I mean, that, that is kind of their decision, right? I mean, you, you made yep. the software at the end of the day. Yep. Um, and I mean, it, it's impressive. I mean, first of all, thank you to the maintainers at Apache because they did get in there and fix this thing fast, right? Like, right. I mean, they recognized the minute it, it kind of blew up, they recognized what the problem was. They recognized that it was that big a deal. And they got in there fast and they spent a lot of hours. They made multiple updates. I mean, we're on version, what, 2.17.1 now. Um, mm -hmm. And it was 2.15 when this whole thing blew up. Or 2.14 even, I think, right? Yeah, I and think there's so, been four. Yeah. 
So, I mean, you know, kudos to them, and it's great. I mean, but, you know, you hate to have to see those types of heroics and then consequently those types of heroics down the chain. Um, so I think the one thing that could happen here, and this is where people get into this kind of, you know, the, the, the evil org is using it without, you know, or taking advantage of it. There are those struggles when you do find a bug or you do just create additional functionality that you think should be part of a package of can we submit a PR back to the maintainer? And now that puts organizations in, a, you know, I've been in these discussions where it's like, okay, well, if we do that, are we liable? And of course, so who do you ask? You ask the lawyers. What are the lawyers going to say? If there's any hint of possible liability anywhere, don't do it. Right. I mean, that it, they shut it down immediately. And so it is tough in those scenarios. But I think overall what this thing highlighted, at least in my opinion, from everybody I've talked to in whether it's small organizations or big enterprise organizations like mine, is that the vast majority of people, especially outside of the technology division, do not understand what open source means to their environment. And that's where I think, you know, Log4j maybe pushed us a little bit. Like, I think it moved that needle a bit. There's a bit more awareness now. But I think as long as we've been having these discussions, and I can remember them back to the late 90s, um, we still don't really understand it at a business level. What does this mean to us? What does it mean if we say no open source? Can we even do that? Or what does it mean if we allow it? Right. Yeah. Um, Are you saying yeah. that when you say they don't mean, they don't understand how important it is, are you talking about like how much open source code they actually have and, and critical to their, basically their bottom line? Yeah. I mean, how much open source they have, where <laughs> it can be found, uh, how complex the problem can be. I mean, you mentioned earlier, just the the idea of these transient dependencies that might be four, five, six levels deep in a dependency tree somewhere, um, you know, that, that's complexity that a lot of organizations don't understand. A lot of organizations don't even fully understand that, like, look, Apache is not a vendor. You're not paying them. You have no contractual relationship with them whatsoever in this case. So they're not a vendor. You can't think about this like third-party vendor manager. This is something completely different. Right. But you also might run into your vendors who also are using this and who are dependent on it. And all of those things came to light with this log 4 j because it was like, okay, we can't just look at our code. We have to look at third-party packages that maybe we purchased that might have this. We have to look at commercial off-the-shelf software, commercial off the shelf software <laughs> that we're using that could have this. We got to talk to our SaaS vendors because they may be, you know, dealing with this as well. We need to understand their posture. So I think just the overall awareness of how just integrated into everything open source is became a lot clearer during this particular response. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Yep. Um, so uh, I'm 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 very much appreciative of of y'all's point of view on this. Um, uh, I you know I thought since we had you here, we we would ask that question. We already asked uh, you know. Oh, and uh, just as an aside, I did send an email to the three uh, Log Four J developers to see if they would come on the show. I have not heard anything back yet. I don't know if I will hear anything back yet, but I, I wanted to you know see if I could get it from the open source developer point of view. Um, you know, just to, to see what it was like for them, if it was, you know, pure hell or, you know, what they would have done different next time or, you know, but I did reach out to them and ask them if they wanted to, to come on the show. Um, and I have not heard anything back. So, uh, their, their companies, cause you know, log4j is a side project for them. They may not be allowed to, I think one of them works for Spotify. So I'm not exactly sure. Um, I, I, I found that I didn't have to hunt that up. That was just on Apache's website. So, um, yeah, but one of them works for, you know, they all work for companies, so they may not have the ability to be able to actually speak there. So, but I just wanted to let everybody know I did give them the option to come and and talk to us. So, um, that was our show for this week. You can find show notes for this and all of our shows at www.breakingsecurity.com. You can also find an RSS link uh, on the site to add to your favorite podcatcher. You can find all of us on Twitter. Miss Berlin can be found at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. 
Mr. Betcher can be found at Betcher Pwned, B-O-E-T-T-C-H-E-R-P-W-N-E-D. And you can follow me on Twitter at Brian Brake, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. We have a Slack. Come join us on our Slack. A lot of great things going on there. A lot of channels of various InfoSec-related subjects. You can get an invite on Twitter by emailing our official Twitter uh, handle for the show at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C, or you can email us at bds.podcast at gmail.com. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters for their monetary assistance by offsetting costs involved in putting out a weekly show. Zoom fees, Libsyn hosting, domain purchase, uh, renewal, uh, equipment upgrades, uh, time and effort building the community we have. Uh, We appreciate all of your help and support. If you'd like a t-shirt, stickers, coffee mug, or just to show your support for the show, you can check out our TPUB site, www.tpublic.com forward slash user forward slash BDS podcast. We thrive on your feedback. Uh, A quick five-star comment on iTunes or Google Play Store or your favorite streaming service, Spotify, Pandora, what have you, uh, go a long way to uh, gaining us additional visibility. It takes no time at all, and we we appreciate uh, your help in spreading the word. That was it for Breaking Down Security this week. Be safe, be well, be kind to one another, take care of yourself because you're the only you you have, and we'll talk to you again soon.